Good afternoon. My name is Justine Reichman. I'm founder of Essential Ingredients, the host of Essential Ingredients. And today with me is Sam Richardson, the founder and owner of Sam's Adventure Snacks. Welcome, Sam. Thank you very much, Justine. It's been um, it's been a couple of months in the works, and I'm very excited and grateful to be on your show, your podcast. We've had a couple of conversations before, and I'm a big fan of your podcast. So it's fun connecting and listening to other food entrepreneurs, see what they're up to, see which stages they're at, and uh, I'm excited for our conversation. Me too. It was great to meet you. Um, I mean, when we met, we met literally at the farmer's market when I caught you off guard mm -hmm. and we did a little impromptu uh, interview. Uh, so I brought that to our Instagram followers so that they could get a little sneak peek at to who you are, what your products are. But for those of us, or for those of those listeners that don't know who you are and what your product is, maybe you can just introduce yourself a little bit and tell them a little bit about what it's set, what is Sam Adventure Snacks? Sure. Um, so my name is Sam and I started Sam's Adventure Snacks a year and a half ago. It was brought out by a desire to create fun, healthy adventure snacks and nut butters for the everyday adventurers so they could power their day's adventure with healthy snacks. Um, it's grown into me being in retail locations, having an online presence, selling at two farmers markets. Um, the time that we met, mm -hmm. it's, my favorite thing is going to the farmers markets, connecting with connecting with customers, telling them my story, telling them telling them the story about where different ingredients are from, and it's really changing my perspective on what a business and what an entrepreneur can be, and it's making me really believe in the grassroots cause and that powerful causes can be built at the grassroots level. And once you build a following, then the word spreads and it spread, spreads naturally and organically. And um, I'm really committed to community building and wanting food to be the vehicle for me to become more of a part of my community. Well, awesome. Well, th thanks for sharing that. One of the things that I really loved when we started chatting was just hearing your story about how you got started. I mean, you got started so organically because you were making a snack for yourself so that you could get, you could eat on your way to work or on your way back as you were being the true athlete or <laughs> that you were biking to and from <laughs> work. Because maybe you could share that story with our listeners. I'll try to keep it, there's a short and a long version. So I was teaching English in Ibiza, Spain for a year, and I moved back, was living uh, on one side of the San Francisco Bay and commuting to the other side of the Bay while driving. And after a few months, I found myself in this repeated bubble and I wanted to break free of the bubble. So I looked on Google Maps, charted out all the different ways that I could get to and from work from kayaking across the Bay, biking, running, walking, and I really began to love this idea that I could have this epic adventure in my daily life, and I would wake up really early excited about what, what I was going to see and what I was going to find and for the sun to rise, and after, during work, I was really excited to get, by, get back on my bike at the end of the day, see what was out on the trail, interact with people in the community, and Initially, it was a way to save a little bit of money on gas also, but I ended up eat, having to eat so much more throughout the day that it ended up working the other way that I was spending more on food. And after having too many energy bars, I had a background in cooking and baking, or it's kind of not a professional background, it's in our family's interest. And I began experimenting with different baked goods and different nut butters that I could make and snack on in the morning, during the trip, after the trip. And that was the conception of the, of the idea. And I thought if, if they're going to be adventure snacks, I might as well put my name on the front and try to embody this uh, idea that uh, someone can really have an adventure in their daily life, whether it's walking their kids to work and uh, walking their kids to school and going a different path and finding uh, seeing a different home that looks really unique or a different tree 
a small little playground that they didn't know of otherwise. And kind of this zest for life is really what encouraged me and propelled me to want to grow this business, want to spread the word that um, that when people are out on the streets, they can really, they really see what's out there. They can become a part of the community. And when did you realize though, that this snack was not just a snack that you thought was fun, but a potential product that you could create and sell and make a business out of? Um, I think it was early on. Uh, I, I would tinker with the idea of trying to commercialize it, trying to get it into stores and farmers markets. And when I began tasting it, uh, it went through many, many iterations. And whenever I would hit a strike of luck, I would taste it and be like, I, I, I want to share this. I want to, I want to try packaging it and experimenting with it, see what I can do with it. Was it because you were that you had that inner entrepreneurial spirit? Was it because mm -hmm. you had always had a dream of making a product? A, a mix of both. I had never created a product before. Had a couple of service-based businesses, and I ran uh, servicing the you know the residential market. And I thought I haven't done a product and I would love to give it a shot. I would love to learn how the food system works. My older brother works for, um, for a food company based in Santa Barbara. So I, I had been exposed more and more to food and I thought I've got to give this a shot and, and see what I can make of it. So I know you had mentioned your brother works for also a company that's very innovative and is mm -hmm. all about building a better for you food system. So I know you're in a space that's really about creating better for you foods. Was that your goal to sort of create a new niche, a new, um, you know, a new sort of carve out a space for yourself in that area? Yeah, hopefully. And whether it's, um, whether it's possible or not, bridging the gap between a pure CPG snack and a baked good is my ultimate goal. It's something that's good for a handful of months, but is really high on the taste scale and hopefully is grown regeneratively. It would be, as I began sourcing different ingredients, it was probably, I would buy five to 10 to 50 pounds of different nuts and flowers at a time. And I began tasting a significant difference between something that was grown commercially, something that was grown organically, and something that was grown regeneratively organically. And a taste has been my number one driver the entire time. And I thought if it's going to be, if something that's regeneratively grown is this much, this this much more tasty than something that's commercially grown, then then I'm all for it. And it seems to be the most um, it's interesting. I think I learned more about agriculture when I was in sixth, sixth and seventh grade in history class when we learned about crop rotation and what, um, how different farms were structured that you would, out of a plot, you would have four different quarters and crops would rotate. And after that period of education, I, don't, I didn't have much exposure to agriculture or food in high school and college. So it became this intriguing thing of, of thinking, how can we, how can I maximize the taste while doing something that is um, kind of inspiring to feel the, the almond orchard that I buy, the almonds from Burroughs Family Farm, an hour west of Yosemite. It's kind of this, as I drive, as you drive through the Central Valley, most of the orchards are, the soil almost looks like a barren concrete there's no life to it. There's not much of a color to it. It's a pale tan gray. Um, but then this orchard kind of at the end of this street just opens up and the, the temperature is cooler. There's a lot of wild grass and flowers that grow in between the, uh, within the orchard. And then there's different livestock that grows or th that roams the orchard. So it's really a symbiotic relationship between the animals, the plants, the coverings, and the trees. And it's this much more natural relationship with food. And on top of it, uh, the almonds use quite a bit less water than commercial almonds. The soil is much healthier, and the end product is significantly tastier. So I want to go back to a couple things. One is you talked about how expensive it was for you to create these bites when you were first doing it for yourself. 
How have you been able to create these bites in a way that makes it accessible for everyone to buy them and for you to be able to sell them to the masses? Yeah, that's something that uh, the bites, they're called Sammy's. And it's um, the best way that I can describe it is that it's a healthy donut hole filled with tri spice almond butter, peanut butter and jam, jam that I make. And it's, it's a, right now it's primarily a good that I sell at the farmer's markets, but it's something that I would love to sell broader than that. So it's a, it's a long burn. And I realize that it's going to take a long-term commitment to it. Um, so there's different, there's different products that I'm rolling out to help fuel the growth and help me learn how different categories within retail space and online works as I'm, as the kind of this core product, the Sammy's hopefully circumvents all of the other products and kind of comes out as the front runner. And I can concentrate all of my energy on that. And if it takes six months or five years, um, I'm committed to it. Essential Ingredients is powered by Next Gen Chef. Next Gen Chef is a movement that supports food and beverage entrepreneurs around the world by fostering a sense of community and providing its members access to mentors and a wealth of resources and guidance. Next Gen Chef feeds members with the knowledge they need to build better for you food and beverage businesses so the world can have greater access to healthier food, comprehensive food education, and increased affordability. If you like what you hear on this podcast, continue the conversation or ask new questions on the Next Gen Chef app, available in the Apple Store and Google Play. Follow Next Gen Chef on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook at Next Gen Chef. Join Next Gen Chef and let's change the future of the food industry together. And so the other thing that I just want to touch on, because many people are not are familiar or are not familiar or just unsure of what it means when we talk about regenerative. And mm -hmm. so you were talking about the difference in the taste and why you choose to work with regenerative uh, products. And so mm -hmm. if you could just, you know, I know you mentioned a few of the reasons why you're choosing regenerative, but if you could just talk a little bit more about that and why it's so important to you, not just to the taste, but the impact it has on the climate or, you know, to go even further, the, you know, the impact on the world or on your products further. Yeah, than it's, and as we were talking about earlier, neither of us are, neither of us um, are farmers per se, but we both have, we both have learned, learned through osmosis what regenerative farming is and the best way that I could describe it is that there's a uh, a few different core pillars to regenerative farming meaning that crops are rotated on the soil so, so the soil health is more healthy introducing ground covering to reduce the amount of water that gets that's evaporated into the air introducing livestock sheep chickens uh, that graze on the grass and they help fertilize the soil, so it's uh, it's a longer lasting soil. Um, so ultimately, it uses less water. The soil is healthier, and it means that the trees have a longer life and can be and can have a healthier life. How does it affect your ability to scale? Is it more expensive to go regenerative? Definitely more expensive. Um, is, uh, compared to other almonds, about two times more expensive. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I'm learning. I don't want to price out most potential customers. So I'm trying to not charge exorbitant amounts. And there's certainly a range. I think uh, if I had to gauge where I am in the market, it's the middle upper market. So not the most expensive spreads or nut butters that you can buy, but in the middle range where it's more accessible to a wider range of people. And I'm hoping that that is where I can have a larger impact by not making it too expensive, but educating people on the benefits of regenerative and for them to taste, be able to taste the difference. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and how do you really communicate this to your customer? Because is it, it's not on your labeling, right? You don't- No, I have, a, I, have, I have a small label. It's something that I'm talking with a couple of friends and advisors about whether it's a, sac it's a sacrifice because right now the label that I have makes it feel homegrown, authentic, local, and people are able to connect with that. 
but it also has limitations in terms of the story that I can tell because when I'm not standing behind a booth at a farmer's market and someone's picking it up from a retail location, then I'm not standing behind that jar. What is going to be standing behind that jar is what I is the story that I tell on the label. So as I go on, I'm um, kind of realizing that it would go a long way to have more of a story on the label and on the packaging to share the story and to make it relatable to other people. Yeah, because I got to imagine um, with the increased cost and the good quality that you have in there and communicating that and having people understand what you're putting in your product is really important, mm -hmm. right? So that they can understand what it is that they're buying. So, you know, they understand what it is they're buying at the market, why it tastes so good. And so that they can then be a third party pitch for you almost, right? Go out there and tell everybody else why this is so good. Not just mm -hmm. that it tastes great, but it tastes great. And also, by the way, they use regenerative almonds and, you know, et cetera, so that th this story can continue to live on. Yeah, and I agree with you. I think some sort of definition that's relatable to people, instead of simply claiming that it's regeneratively grown, what is regenerative? And more importantly, why should someone care? Why should someone care? And, and I think some people are being pushed away from certain nuts because of the amount of water that they consume. Um, it, it's frequently a question that people have at the farmer's markets of, do you know how much water this almonds consume? Do you know how much water these other nuts consume? And, and what I realized is that the, it's not that they're not interested in buying. They want to see the dedication of a business owner to increasing the quality of where they source from. And if someone is able to say that these almonds use quite a bit less water, are grown regeneratively, do less harm to the planet, um, then it's something that they can really get behind. So how long ago did you start this business? A year and a half. A year and a half, so during COVID? Yeah, during COVID. I had been tinkering with the idea for a year with another friend, then at a certain point, I just realized I've got to start. I've got to start experimenting. We're both we're living in different states, and I want to give this a shot. And if that means going off on my own, so be it. Um, so it's been it it's been fun. It's it's great to interact with other food people. One of the great things about the farmers markets is right at the end, kind of the bell rings, market closes, and there's a mad dash to trade goods between one another. So farmers who have a lot of produce are interested in selling or trading their goods for people with more of a longer lasting shelf life goods. So it's fun to connect with the other vendors, understand where they're coming from. They're trying to raise the bar for what they can do with agriculture and their own farms. And um, there's a commercial kitchen that I rent in Napa I'll drive up there usually two times a week. I'm based in San Francisco and I'll drive up two nights out of the week. And it's this group of really committed food entrepreneurs who are trying to raise the standards, their own standards for baked goods, pastries, cheese. Um, and it's fun being a part of this community and, and people are really supportive of one another and want to see one another succeed. So when you started this a year and a half ago, did you initially join this uh, kitchen in Napa or was that later on? It took about six months to get it going through the permitting, the legal system. And once I got it rolling, it was. Okay, so it uh, took you six months to get it going. Uh, did you have a lot of challenges between COVID and just it being a new business and a new idea? Oh, tons of challenges. Um, even though, even though your top three challenges as a new business and, uh, you know, this was new to you, new to food and a new business owner. Mm -hmm. uh, top three challenges. Number one was between, uh, number one was the legal and the permitting process. I, in the beginning, I was committed to doing it the proper way. And I didn't, I hadn't fully appreciated how stringent the restrictions for food are. So it humbled me to stay on top of it. And there's city, county, and state regulations that someone has to fall under. 
and it's made me more committed to getting on top of permitting quickly. Um, I would say the second challenge is expressing the difference between this product and the next product on the shelf. So the products that I have on the most shelves out of anything is are the different nut butters. And frequently buyers at grocery stores will say, well, we already have five or six different almond butters. Why do we need to carry another one? Or we have multiple peanut butters and we make our own. Why do we need to carry yours? And my go-to response is taste it. <laughs> yeah, All in like, the taste. Taste is taste is king, really. Taste taste is absolutely king. If if taste someone tries king. it, they, they I I hope that they get hooked at the markets. I'll give out free samples to someone and I'll say, like, I hope this gets you hooked. And and sometimes it does. And, and then I would say my third biggest challenge was underappreciating the amount of uh, persistence that across the board would be needed. Uh, it's a lot of initiative. And as a, one, as a one man show, if I don't do something, no one else will. And I have a long to-do list and big aspirations and big goals with the company. And it really starts with breaking it into smaller goals. So it's taking the initiative and being persistent with getting things done and getting things across the line. And the more I've realized, the more positive energy I, that I put into it, the more positive energy comes out and trying to remove some of my emotion from the business. So if something bad happens, it's not so much that it's bad or if something good happens. It's not so much that it's good. Uh, it's just something that happens and it's something that I need to approach and move past. So here we are a year and a half later, you've got, you've got your permits, you've got your licenses, you have your kitchen, you're making your, you're making your butters, you're at the farmer's markets, you're in stores, you're being <laughs> sold, you're running around. Are you still kayaking and taking your nut butters to work? No, you're not doing that anymore. No, not anymore. <laughs> not anymore. There's not <laughs> enough time in the day. <laughs> it would be fun. I, 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 I wouldn't mind. That would, that would be fun. Maybe in, a, maybe in a couple of years when it's when I've got my ground, my feet on the ground. Okay. So what, what can we see for Sam's adventure uh, in the coming in the coming years? What's uh, are you going to expand? Um, um, my first goal is to develop as strong of a local presence in first San Francisco, then the Bay Area, then Northern California. And that is my current progression timeline. And kind of the other companies that I aspire to be are like Belgium's Neuhaus, kind of the best chocolatier. Oh, I, I love Neuhaus. No, the, 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 best, the best chocolate. Um, okay. and they then, have a little store in department stores. Yeah, in, in New York. They, in, they that's need, where I'm from. <laughs> yeah, they need to open a couple in, they need to open a couple in San Francisco. Um, but it's like they just raised the bar for quality. So something like humbly something in between Neuhaus and Nutella or Biscoff is And Nutella my... also has like their little store, like I think they had one at the bottom of Italy in New York too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um and you could go sit there and oh my god, I'm just getting I'm getting all nostalgic for when I was a little girl. Like, yeah, and it's spoon. It sounds like in Belgium, you can go into the store and buy a single chocolate for 50 cents or a dollar and get a full bag for, for the I cost think they of- even customize the Nutella thing so you can have your name put on them now. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay, so that's, I want, those are big goals. I'm gonna be following you. Everyone's gonna be following you. We're all gonna follow you on Instagram because we're gonna watch to see when the store opens, when you're gonna have your, your, mm -hmm. your store in all the different continents. Yeah, I, I've re I kind of realized that whenever I would be traveling or doing any type of adventure or anything else in my, before I started this, is that I would be dreaming and daydreaming of what kind of business could I start? What kind of story could I tell? And I've realized that I'm at the beginning of the moment and I'm currently completely, I'm committed to it. I see a lot of potential in it. And I think it's gonna be, I'm fully comfortable with the long, slow burn of this to be like developed into a powerhouse 
over multiple decades of work. Well, that sounds great. And we're going to be following you and watching you closely and going to keep visiting you at the farmer's markets and mm -hmm. look forward to seeing you in the stores. So for all those people watching this podcast or, or watching this video cast on uh, YouTube or listening to the podcast, where can they find you online? Yeah, my website is samsadventuresnacks.com. Instagram, Pinterest, and Facebook is Sam's Adventure Snacks. And I'm in control of each of the web pages. I'm in control of the website and the social media. So if you message, if you send a message, I'll be the one responding, uh, usually with a little bit too much enthusiasm. And if you're in Marin area, you can find them at the Larkspur Landing um, mm -hmm. uh, Farmer's Market, because that's where I met them. Mm -hmm. So Sam, thank you so much for joining us today. It was great to have you here. I love your nut butters. I'm very excited to come and get the one for Minnie and Misty. I'm sorry I missed you that time. We had a little snafu here. Mm -hmm. But I want to thank our listeners for tuning in. And I want to thank Sam for joining us. And we're here every Tuesday. And um, we'll see you here again soon. And we want to catch up with you again in the coming months to see how things are progressing. Sounds good, Justine. Thank you. Thank you. To find out more about this episode of Essential Ingredients and access show notes, check out Next Gen Chef and choose podcast in the menu bar. If you like this episode, head to iTunes or Next Gen Chef's YouTube channel to subscribe. Learn more about Next Gen Chef, the platform that powers this podcast, by checking out our website or visit us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn at Next Gen Chef. You can also check out my Instagram at Justine underscore Reichman. If you have thoughts about this episode or future episode ideas, leave us a comment at Next Gen Chef's YouTube channel or drop an email at team at nextgenchef.com. Thanks for joining us.